but thank you for joining Darien Library for week three of a commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War. And we're gonna be discussing the helicopter today. Mark Albertson is a historical research editor at Army Aviation Magazine and is a longtime member of the United States Naval Institute. In addition, Mark teaches history at Norwalk Community College. And we're lucky to share the next hour with him. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections available to the community. Good afternoon, everyone. This is um, week three of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War. And last week did the overall view of the war itself. Uh, I, when I began to put this together. I wasn't going to go into the battles, you know, all these, all these battles that really doesn't, that really doesn't accomplish what I really wanted to accomplish as opposed to having a more widespread knowledge of the war itself, which is what we're going to have here. Um, having said that, uh, this, this topic today is kind of an oddball from the perspective that no one really talks about it. Uh, the helicopter in um, in Korea. Uh, the, but to go back to it, I, I want to go back to the start of why the helicopter became important. And that is the one of the biggest spurs for the use of the helicopter. And this isn't to say the helicopter would not have been used, but one of the biggest spurs for its use to move people around. And I'm talking from a, a view of combat moving people, you know, dropping people off with a helicopter when they're done picking them up and moving them someplace else was because of the atomic bombs. Uh, the atomic bomb will change many things and a lot of them is gonna be how we conduct war. And so on, uh, on July 16, 19, 1945, uh, Operation Trinity, where they set the first bomb off in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and it worked. And so on August 6, 1945, the United States Army Air Force will drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Three days later, it will drop a second atomic bomb on uh, Nagasaki, August 9, 1945. And a little piece of trivia for you. There is one man in the history of, in, in history, not only history of air power, but in history, one pilot who flew both missions. His name was, he was a major then, Charles Sweeney. He later retired from the United States Air Force it was as a, in the rank of Lieutenant General. He actually flew the instruments plane to measure the blast at, Nagas at uh, Hiroshima. He then flew the bomb plane at Nagasaki. Box car was the name of the B-29. So Charles Sweeney is the only pilot in history in the entire history to fly both atomic bomb missions, quite an exclusive club. But there are gonna be some sober thinkers coming out of this war who think you cannot conduct war in the future as you had conducted World War II. Uh, you know, keep in mind here at this point, the 19, you're coming up to 1947, when uh, these airmen, these these airmen, these airmen who really were supporters of strategic air power, uh, moving the plane from supporting the troops on the ground to bombing cities or bombing an enemy's capability of waging war, uh, they believe they proved their point. They also believe prior to the war that they would prove their point. Well, in World War II, essentially they did. Although I, you know, you know the um, Sir Arthur Harris of British Bomber Command thought that he, he will be the man who will lead the British, the British bombing effort at night against Nazi Germany. And, we, and the United States Eighth Army Air Force will bomb Germany during the day. Harris thought that if the United States joined them uh, against bombing, uh, not so much bombing port and dock facilities, factories, airfields, but bombing the cities themselves, burning down German cities to the ground. He believed that if he could house 20% of German workers, the allies could win the war because the Germans wouldn't be able to produce. The United States didn't go with this, but at night, 
Harris was not so much interested in bombing factories, port and dock facilities, and airfields. He was interested in just burning German cities to the ground. And he will succeed in doing this. He will succeed in doing this. He would send over anywhere from 500 to 700 to 1,000 planes in a night, all armed with fire bombs, all burning German cities to the ground. That's what he thought they had to do. However, having said that, even that alone, minus the bomb, does change how, how people are beginning to think about military affairs. Uh, you know, and after the war is over, after the war is over with, becomes demobilization. So you're going to be losing a lot of men. Uh, they want the Amer Americans here. You had 16 million, 112,399 Amer 566 Americans in a uniform, and over 15 million want to get out. They 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 want to they want to rejoin the peacetime world, and so. And so, what, and so when you see demobilization, it will be the Air Force that, that will probably uh, have the lead, be the lead service with regards to budgetary money. Why? Because of the bomb, because of the strategic bomber. Uh, there will be various plans on the table to make more, to more modern bombers. Bombers that will have even a longer range, carry even a heavier payload. Although keep in mind, and this is becoming gospel now, we don't, because of the atomic bomb, we don't need to send over 500 or 1,000 planes against one city. All you need is a few armed with atomic weaponry. That will, that, that will, that will, that will enlist the destruction. You don't need to send over thousands of men and hundreds of aircraft anymore. It's not necessary. Well, what does that do about land war? You know, it's always been that the, the war is decided by the man with the rifle or the bow and arrow or the sword or the pike. He's left on the battlefield. If your men armed with these weapons are left on the battlefield, you usually won. That's changed now because of the bomb. You can't, you can't fight war the way it used to be. Things have to change. Uh, there's a man by the name of Lieutenant General Roy S. Geiger. He's a, he's a commander of the Fleet Marine Force in the Pacific. He's a Lieutenant General. And he goes to the, he goes to the to, uh, test, Operation Crossroads. You probably, some of you, if you're old enough, will probably remember this from the newsreel footage. They are the tests that the Navy conducted at Bikini Island in the Pacific. And they tested atomic weaponry. They tested them twice in the month of July, 1946, against ships in the Bikini Island Lagoon. And at the end of these tests, Lieutenant General Roy S. Geiger went back to Hawaii to his office. Immediately, he sat down. And he began to write a letter to General Arch, 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 Archie, Archibald Archie Vandergriff, and who was, who was the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. And he informed, or he, he informed Vandergriff that the, way, that the days of waging conventional war as it used to be waged are over. In particular, he went with amphibious landings. Keep in mind, uh, Geiger is an interesting character from the perspective that during the, during the war in the Pacific, he commanded the third amphibious group, which was a composite of Marines and, and, and GIs who would hit the beaches on these Pacific islands against the Japanese. He was also a licensed pilot. So he knew, he, and he was, a, he was a military pilot. He knew both ground warfare and air warfare from the perspective of supporting the ground troops. He, he writes in this letter that the days of fighting a war as if in World War II are over. And he names, he names three places, Operation Husky, the island of Sicily, Operation Normandy, you know, op, uh, the Operation Watch, to Operation uh, Overlord, and he also notes Operation Iceberg, Okinawa, the last, the last big battle of the war. All three have one thing in common. 
They were all amphibious landings. He impresses upon General Vandergriff that in the future, be keep in mind, this is 1946, we still have the monopoly on the bomb. We blew the bomb in 45, but the Soviets will not get a bomb until 1949. But at this point, we have the monopoly. Van, uh, uh, Lieutenant Geiger, Lieutenant General Geiger does not believe that monopoly is going to last. He said, he said the, the, our enemies are going to get the bomb. So we cannot have amphibious landings like we used to. Imagine one atomic bomb hitting a beach at Normandy. What would have happened to those guys on the beach? How about some of the ships in the harbor? So we have to come up with something new. He, he has the idea of using light aircraft, and the helicopter will come into this, using, putting people at, dispersing men on the beaches or inland from the beaches. You will drop them in pockets, and then at the proper time, use those light aircraft and later helicopters to bring them back together for a concerted attack. But he said the days, of landing men on a, just solely landing men on a beach. We can still land them on a beach, but we need to be able to move them around, are over. And we need to proceed into the Cold War on this basis. And this is exactly what the United States Marine Corps is going to do. Vandergriff likes the idea. He likes, he likes what Geiger has put forward. And so Roy S. Roy, Roy S. Geiger, General Roy S. Geiger, uh, together with an army general named James M. Gavin, who at this point is a major general. He, by the way, was America's, the United States Army's airborne soldier extraordinaire. He was, by the way, an Operation Husky. He was at Normandy. Uh, he is the, and if you remember the movie, The Bridge Too Far, Ryan O'Neill played General Gavin here. Gavin was at that at that battle too, the battle battle for the Nijmegen Bridge, which was a, which was also partially a parachute operation. He, by the way, writes in an article in 1946 that the future of moving men is in the air. He said that he said light aircraft and helicopters. And this is where they're going with this. This is his notion. You know, you move men by truck or by Jeep or by tank. The earth has obstacles or impediments, rivers. Maybe somebody cuts down trees and blocks a road. How about hills and mountains? Uh, but an aircraft will fly over rivers. It will fly over hills. It can fly over mountains. There are no impediments in the air. It's wide open. You can move men by the air. Now, his argument here is, again, he's not a big fan now of with, with seeing the helicopter. He's not a fan of the glider anymore. He's not a fan of pe the parachute. He, being a paratrooper himself, he knew that silk was not overly accurate. Supposing there's a wind, you're blown off your drop zone. If for those who have read about the, the invasion of Normandy, the guys from the 82nd Airborne Division were blown onto the landing and the, on the drop zones of the 101st Airborne. Guys from the 101st Airborne were blown into the drop zones of the 6th British Parachute op, uh, Division. They were blown all over the Normandy countryside. That was a problem with silk. The glider, many of the gliders were built of plywood. They were reusable, but if a plywood, but if a glider came down heavy and there's damage, how are you going to reuse the glider unless it's repairable? That's not the problem with the helicopter. The helicopter won't be blown all over creation. The helicopter is reusable. You land in a patch, you drop off your men. When the proper time with, with the proper time, you go back and you pick them up and you move them to another quarter or move them to the rear. This was what guy. This is what well, Geiger is going to think of this too. But this is what General Gavin is thinking of, and when he writes this article, in I think it was Infantry Magazine in 1946, uh, not as many people thought about it. In fact, 
uh, we're getting into that part two where the Air Force, now not being divorced from the Army in 1947, was getting a little big for its britches here. In fact, the Air Force was the one the Army had to order their aircraft through, and the Air Force was frowning on the Army owning a lot of aircraft. They did not want a rival Air Force. And Gavin went in and talked to the, uh, talked to the uh, Air Force general who procured aircraft, and he said, we need helicopters. And the Air Force general replied, the helicopter is a piece of, mach is a piece of machinery that can't get off the ground. And he says, it's like being in a bucket and you trying to lift yourself up with the handles of the bucket when you're standing in the bucket. Gavin doesn't see things this way and neither does Geiger. The United States Marine Corps is moving ahead with their plans. Vandergriff is convinced that we need to develop a capability to accommodate light aircraft and helicopters to move our men around. And interesting here, what, what the Marine Corps is coming up with. And there's a Colonel named Hogaboom, who in the Marine Corps, who will be one of the big pushers of this. In fact, in the 1950s, there will be something known as the Hogaboom Doctrine. This is based on a doctrine that the Marine, Corps will, the Marine Corps will come out with. It's called the vertical assault concept. During the Second World War, Marines were usually, uh, you know, they usually got on those landing barges. You've seen these movies, you've seen documentaries. They get to the beach, the, tra front, the, fr the, front, uh, the front ramp goes down and the guys run on the beach. That's not what the Marine Corps is now thinking to do. They are thinking of taking old World War II aircraft carriers, like the small aircraft carriers, turning them into uh, helicopter carriers where men will be lifted from the helicopter carriers instead of being dropped on the beach by these landing craft, they will be dropped behind the beach by light aircraft, but in particular as this gains steam, the helicopter. And then at the proper time, you send those helicopters in, they pick up these men and put them into the place where they're really gonna launch an attack. They're gonna concentrate them. But in the beginning, you spread them out. So if the enemy does use a nuclear weapon, not all the assault troops will be killed. They're spread out. And so they're using air mobility here to move people around. That's where they're going with this. The Army, by the way, having been divorced, have, having that, the Air Force been divorced from them, it seems like it's the other way around. The Air Force now has control, and they are very, and they are very particular about the Army getting a lot of planes. Sure, the Army at this point has some of the old cubs from World War II, but they're getting kind of long in the tooth here. And by the time the Korean War starts, the Army only has 56 helicopters. That's it. That's all they have. And so as these doctrines develop during the war, it was thought by many of these theorists, keep in mind the late 40s going into 1950, that the helicopter was being prepared for the nuclear battlefield. Very few are thinking it's gonna be done on a conventional battlefield. Everyone is thinking for the most part, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Operation Crossroads at, 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 at Bikini Island, now that the Soviets have a bomb, the next war, if it's gonna be fought, will be with nuclear weapons. And so these generals are thinking that on a nuclear battlefield, and one of the ideas that comes out here is Europe. It's going to be fought in Europe. Why? Because this is where the Soviets are at a standoff with the Western allies, with the division of Germany. It's thought by some of these officers that, yes, if we're going to have a war, nuclear weapons might be used. And if they're going to be used, we now have to have that capability to move these people around. But at the same time, at the same time, the Air Force is not a big fan of the helicopter. The Air Force likes the big toys. They like these big bombers. They like these speedy fighters. I mean, some of these pilots really don't want to fly ground support plane. That's not sexy. Being a fighter pilot is sexy. Even more sexy than a bomber pilot. But the bomber gives the Air Force offensive punch. Many of these officers in the Air Force see that ground support for the Army 
is defensive firepower, not offensive. And offensive firepower for the Air Force is the bomber. And now it's with nuclear weapons. Interesting what's going to happen here to change this argument. On June 25, 1950, as I went in before, the North Korean army, 90,000 of them crash across the 38th parallel. And the first real helicopter unit sent into action is the Air Force Third Rescue, uh, Third Rescue Squadron, which is based in Japan. And they are there to pick up downed Air Force pilots. You know, a pilot gets shot down, the helicopter goes and picks them up. Now, keep in mind, these helicopters are not elaborate. They're not like you, they're nowhere like you see now. In fact, how many here remember the show MASH? I'm sure you remember that show, that helicopter with the glass bulbous front to it. That's a Bell helicopter H-13. In fact, I don't know how many remember the TV show Whirly Birds. It was the same helicopters being used on that TV show. The show lasted about two or three years and then they yanked it. But it was about a guy who owned a helicopter company. He did The stories revolved around what he was using his helicopter for. But that's the same helicopter they used in MASH. But that was the helicopter used in Korea to evacuate wounded. That's coming. But however, the Third Air Rescue Squadron was picking up whatever downed pilots had to be picked up. However, as the Korean War snowballed through the summer of 1950 into the fall, they were getting more and more calls about picking up wounded. Keep in mind the terrain of Korea. Much of it is mountainous. There was not a real infrastructure for or as far as a road system goes and forget railroads. And so to somebody who's wounded, put into a truck or a Jeep and move to a hospital, that might take hours. Man might bleed to death. So what comes up here? Using the helicopter to evacuate wounded. And in that summer going into the fall of 1950, the Air Force rescues upwards of 83 men who were wounded as soldiers and taken to the hospital. It's a straight ahead shot to the hospital. In fact, during the during the you know, modern military medicine, it was found in World War II had advanced to the point where out of every 100 GIs, the United States Army did a, did a study on this. For every 100 GIs, the death rate of men who were delivered to doctor's care was four and a half percent. That's how much medicine had advanced. With Korea, by the end of the war, because of this developing ability to actually move men by helicopter to a hospital, the loss rate for every 100 GIs who were wounded went from 4.5 to 2.5. That's a big drop. The helicopter will prove itself as a as a as a as a savior for the soldiers. And in, interestingly enough, if you talk to Vietnam vets in particular, uh, I know I have one that lives up the street from me, Danny Caporell. Uh, Danny put three combat tours in Vietnam as a Marine, as a Marine Corps sniper. He was there from, he was there 63, 64, 65, and he was living with the mountain yards in the mountains. And Danny was attached to an CIA program of sniping at the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. And he was wounded twice. But he said, he said, he, as a Marine, he said, those helicopter pilots, he said, it didn't make any difference what uniform they were wearing. To us, they were gods. Interest, interesting where this is gonna go here. The regard for the helicopter and the pilots that flew them, fascinating. But in Korea in 1950, a helicopter detachment will be put together for the 8th Army in Korea. And this is in the fall of 1950. It is the, the first Army helicopter detachment to arrive is on November 22nd, 1950. The second helicopter detachment. And the first commander of an army detachment of this kind is a captain by the name of Albert C. Seaborn. He's in command. He has four of those helicopters you saw on MASH, MASH, the, the H-13. 
he's got he's got he's got several pilots and he's got some mechanics. Keep in mind the other problem with the helicopter. Uh, they're not as easy to fix as the simple cub type aircraft that the army used to have. You now have to have mechanics who are now trained as mechanics. You know, in World War II, when army avi when uh, artillery men were trained as, as pilots and mechanics to fly those cubs, if you could fix your 1936 Chevrolet in the backyard of your house, you could fix a cub. That's not the case now. It is more, helicopters are more sophisticated. So now you're training, you're now training mechanics who do nothing but fix helicopters. This growing sophistication now within army aviation is now accelerating because of the helicopter. But here you see this, 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 uh, this, this second helicopter detachment uh, forms the army's core capability for medical evacuations in the Korean War. In fact, in the first six months of 1951, with only 12, with only 11 helicopters, that's all they had in the first six months of 1951, they airlifted 1,985 wounded soldiers to doctor's care with 11 helicopters in six months, which at the time, was quite an accomplishment. Keep in mind, they're learning this as they go along. There is no, there is no textbook here. These guys are writing the textbook for the next wave that will come up. In fact, over the course of the rest of the Korean War, these army helicopters will, will be able to take to army hospitals or Navy hospitals for that matter, 21,000 wounded GIs, most of that in the last two years of the war. That's quite an accomplishment for these aircraft. If you remember MASH, those, 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 those H-13s, at most, the only, the only, you can only carry two wounded at a time, one on top of each of those pontoons on the bottom of the plane. You couldn't put them inside the, you couldn't put them inside the helicopter. They had to be wrapped in blankets and they had to have a break to break the wind. They're out in the open. That's how they're moving them. They're not inside an aircraft. And so they're learning this as they go along. But the system does work. That's the point. All they need are other aircraft that are more sophisticated. You put the wounded inside the aircraft. So they're out of the elements. And at this point, keep in mind, with these little H-13 helicopters, there's only a helicopter pilot. There is no medic. Later on, obviously here in these helicopters, there will be a medic. But at this point, there are no medics attached to the helicopter, not to fly. It's just the pilot and the wounded. And so does that mean some men will get lost? Well, yeah, they will. But again, they're learning this along the way. They're learning this along the way. This, um, however, there's also other uses for the helicopter as well. They're beginning to move supplies and equipment. They're, they're gonna begin to move men. This was, this was a fear with some of these officers that thought that the helicopter could not take punishment, that, 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 it, had, that it was too dainty, it, it, it was too weak to take a lot of punishment. In the beginning, that's true. But as they go along here, again, it's the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is actually the leader of this thus far. And in the, they have a Marine Corps transport squadron that gets to Korea in September of 1951. It's Marine Helicopter Transport Squadron 161. And they have 15, they call them HRS-1s. They are actually they are actually uh, the Sikorsky R5 helicopters. And these helicopters go into action here. And in Operation Windmill uh, on September 13, 1951, this helicopter squadron of the Marine Corps uh, lifted, lifted Marines to Hill, uh, Hill 673 near the, what place called the Punch Bowl on the, on the, on the, uh, on the 38th parallel. 
and they actually they brought out they brought in supplies they took out wounded you're now beginning to see this is now it's going to become a regular feature and on the 21st during operation summit for the first time the marines airlifted 224 combat marines in relief of Repu republic republic of korean soldiers this is the first time this was done with this amount of men, 224 combat Marines lifted the Hill 884. Again, they are writing the book. There is no, there is no book to, there is no book learning here. They are writing the manual for this. Uh, the Marines also developed something known as the hit and get. <laughs> this was done in 1952, where the Marines. Uh, would put rocket launchers on the helicopters, drop them off, the guys would fire their complement of ammo, and then the helicopter would come back in and pick them up and move them so the North Koreans and Chinese couldn't hit them back. It was called hit and get. Someone else is going to come up with a nickname too and call it shoot and scoot. That name's going to pop up here too later on. And so they are, they are experimenting here in this battlefield known as Korea. But keep in mind, they're beginning to use the helicopter not on an atomic battlefield, on a conventional battlefield, a battlefield some Air Force officers said would not exist. You know, with the atomic bomb and the long range bomber, uh, the, you know, the war, the push button war, if you remember that terminology here. And so again, they're finding new ways here to advance the helicopter in this war. Uh, Marine success uh, causes General Matthew Ridgway of the United States Army. He wants, he wants Army transport squadrons of helicopters to be sent to Korea to not only move supplies and equipment, but to move men. And so the Sikorsky Aircraft Company has a helicopter called the H-19. And now you're going to be able to move men inside, well, inside a larger helicopter. And they're going to transport this helicopter to Korea and it will be used. And so it now, again, this is now becoming more sophisticated. And it helps when a general like Matthew Ridgway finally, you know, believes here that this helicopter can be used to move men on a battlefield that's actually taking place at that stage of the game. And so in 1953, the Sixth Transportation Helicopter Company arrives, and they've got 24 of these Sikorsky H-19 helicopters. And they are the first heliborne cargo unit in existence to be employed in a combat zone. And on March 20, 1953, in support of the 3rd Infantry Division in Korea, they resupplied a unit cut off by a flood. They moved in 30, they flew in 34,000 pounds of stores and equipment that never would have arrived by truck because the unit had been cut off by floodwaters. And in two operations in, in June of night, in June of night, May and June of 1953, they flew in more than 2.5 million pounds of supplies. Now it is beginning to really, pardon the pun, take off. And more and people, and more people are beginning to understand that this could be a this could be a this could be a projection for the future. And it is. And so here, and so here you begin, you see that as this matures here during the Korean War, there are now going to be people following the Korean War that are going to be thinking that we need larger helicopter. This is going the same way that the bomber went out of coming out of World War I. We need bombers that are larger. We need bombers that can fly farther. We need bombers that can carry more of a payload with, 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 really, in, with really educated crews, you know, wedded to this doctrine of, of, uh, of strategic bombing. The helicopter is going through the same thing. We now need larger helicopters. We now need trained crews. We now need more mechanics. You see what's happening here? The same thing that happened coming out of 1918 is now coming out of 1953. This is what war did to, this air, to the air, to aircraft. 
in Europe, there's an operation called Operation Sagebrush. And there were a number of these. The army is using the helicopter in Europe on what they configure as a nuclear battlefield. What was discussed in the late 1940s is now being put into action in Europe. Every helicopter that the Army has is going to be consigned to the, almost every helicopter the Army has is going to be consigned to these operations. At the same time, helicopters are being built in the United States. They need larger aircraft. So instead of small ones with one propeller, you are now beginning to see helicopters with two main rotors, one in the rear, one forward. And these will be used to transport people. Instead of carrying maybe six or seven or eight, you're now gonna see helicopters able to carry 10, 15, 20, 30 some odd guys. This is where this is going. The reality of using a helicopter on a battlefield is really being rammed home at this point. And so here in Korea, which was that stepping stone of proving the helicopter on a battlefield, it is now taking off, so to speak. And not only, not only medical evacuations, which is now be gonna become more sophisticated in Vietnam and not just moving supplies, not just moving men on a battlefield, some people are coming up with the idea, well, how about arming the helicopter? That definitely the Air Force didn't want the Army doing because they thought the Army would come up with, air, with helicopters that could be used by an Army to, for close air support of men on the ground. That's not ready yet, but it will be. In fact, if you look at an aircraft known as the Apache helicopter, that's exactly what that is. That's where we've gone. But in the 1950s, there was a man by the name of, of, name of uh, Colonel Vanderpool, Colonel J. Vanderpool. And interesting from the perspective, he was not a flyer, he was not an aviator, but he believed in the concept. And he took some of these small Bell helicopters that you see on MASH that were delivering wounded, he began in training exercises, began to arm these things. He begged, borrowed, and stole guns, ammunition, and equipment from where he could get it. He had friends in the Marine Corps. He had friends in the Air Force who on the sly gave him stuff. 30 caliber machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, 20 millimeter cannon. And he began to experiment with using the air, the air, the helicopter as now a gunship. This is where Korea has now sent this plane. This is where the atomic bomb has now, this is what the atomic bomb has really started here. And so now people are taking this thing known as the helicopter and more sophisticated aircraft are coming out. And so, but in Europe, these, op, these, these training exercises of using the helicopter, they are beginning to, they think beginning to prove using the helicopter on a nuclear battlefield to move these men around on a contaminated, on a contaminated battlefield. In fact, the army, not to be left out of the nuclear arms race, maybe Keith, you saw some of these, uh, those 280 millimeter atomic cannon. So instead of calling an aircraft to, to drop an atomic weapon, the army had a cannon that fired an, 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 an atomic artillery round about 20 miles. And so interesting here how the army is now trying to acclimate itself to the nuclear battlefield. But in 1960, something known as the Rogers Board shows up. The army together with 40, about 42 different aircraft companies they want aircraft developed specifically for the army to move people and equipment around. This will be followed in 1962 by something known as the Howes Board. This is General Hamilton Howes. Hamilton Howes was actually began life as a cavalryman. He went into armor, tanks. Now he's in army aviation. 
and he leads this research board based off what happened in Europe in the 1950s and based off what has been recorded what happened with the helicopter in the 1950s during the Korean War. He puts together something, it'll be known as the house board. It's also, it also will be known as the air mobility concept. And so you saw here develop with the Marine Corps prior to the Korean War, this vertical assault concept where you use air, light aircraft, but now they're moving mostly toward the helicopter to move men from these light carriers offshore and move men inland, move men inland by helicopter. The army is now gonna, is now gonna have aircraft designed and the one that comes to mind here will be the poster child expression of the, of the United States Army in Vietnam. It's known as the UH-1 Huey. I'm sure some of you have seen that aircraft. Uh, it had a turbine engine to it. It had its men inside. Uh, it could carry seven, eight, nine men into combat with a pilot and a co-pilot. And with this training that was going on from 1962, 1963, and a, and a, and a division will be formed, the 11th, the 11th Air, Assault, Air Assault Division test. This was a division that was used in these training exercises in 1962 and later trained in 1963, 1964. Meanwhile, in Vietnam, taking off from what happened in Korea, American helicopters were moving South Vietnamese troops around in 1961, 62, 63, and 64. They are testing the com the, the, this, this air mobility concept in battle, but in Vietnam, moving South Vietnamese troops in action against the Viet Cong. And it seems to work. Only now you're not in a mountainous area and an area with mountains and valleys and riverbed and rivers and rivers rivers like Korea, you are now in an area riven with jungle. Now your environment's different. It's also different on the aircraft, with very much that heat and humility and humidity and jungle corruption. However, it's found here that the South Viet South Vietnam South Vietnamese soldiers don't seem to have, and this was a complaint by many American officers, that stick to of for battle with the communist guerrillas in the jungles. And so as more helicopters are being built, and as the helicopter pilots and crews show that this, this process of air mobility will work, in 1965, in the summer of 1965, that training division, the 11th Air Assault Division test, Will now be will now be reflagged in July of 1965. It will be called the first air the first air cavalry division air mobile. They will be sent to Vietnam in August, and in November of 1965. In fact, maybe you saw the movie on this. We were soldiers once and young. The Battle of Iadrang. And these helicopters, again, that learning curve from Korea, go back to what I mentioned before in September of 1951, when, Mar when Marine helicopters dropped 224 combat Marines on a hill facing the communist troops. Now you have helicopters delivering men behind enemy lines, and they will supply them and keep them supplied while they're behind enemy lines. This is what the Battle of Iadrang represented. This leapfrog effect of the helicopter. It is now much more modern than it was in Korea. But again, we're proving that the helicopter works, but it's not on a nuclear battlefield. It's now on another conventional battlefield. It's called Vietnam. In regards to medical evacuations, that has become so sophisticated, you now have separate units that do that. They are called dust off, if you've ever heard that term before. And one of the reasons they're called dust off because when they take off, they raise all this dust. So they call them dust off. But you might see some combat footage or still pictures of helicopters in, Viet in Vietnam with the Red Cross emblem on the, 
on the fuselage. That is called, that is, that is a dust off helicopter. And keep in mind, unlike in Korea, you now have a medic on board of some of these helicopters able to take care of wounded on board these helicopters. In fact, it has gotten to such a sophistication that many of these pilots who flew these evacuation helicopters, and these guys, again, were looked upon as gods. Some of these pilots would fly into a battlefield with shells whizzing all over the place to go in and pick up the wounded. Were a few shot down? Yes. Did most make it? Yes, but some of them got shot up pretty much. In fact, the, um, the man I work for, the editor of Army Aviation Magazine, his name is Joe Pisano. Joe flew in Vietnam and uh, he was delivering troops and picking them up. And I remember him telling me one time he dropped men off. It was in the Central Highlands. And he said they had to go back and pick them up. And the landing zone was called a hot zone. Uh, there was a lot of fighting going around around, the, around the, the, the landing zone. And Joe landed his Huey and the crew chief opens up the, the side sliding door so these guys can get in. And Joe, because now there's AK-47 rounds coming through the windshield. Uh, fortunately, Joe didn't get hit. But, uh, but, you know, he's yelling, get these, get there, you know what's inside this, inside this chopper and let's get the hell out of here. And Joe said he pulled up and he said he, they lifted off, but he said they were under heavy fire even as they were leaving. And so many of these GIs who were carried by helicopters said that these pilots were gods. They, they, so they had no, no aversion to flying in to help us out or pick us up or drop us off. Uh, so it's quite it's quite a it's quite a it's quite a story of how the helicopter first emerges here, and then in the late 1940s into the 1950s during Korea, how this is being put together to what you saw in Vietnam. You know, it's now it's now an entity unto itself. The military can no longer do without the helicopter. That's where we've come. In fact. Uh, just to give you an example, these medical evacuees and medical evacuations, there was a man by the name of Michael Novosel. Michael Novosel wasn't, was, wasn't too much taller than Peter Lorre. He was actually a bomber pilot in World War II, trained to fly B-29s. In fact, they didn't think he would make it because he was too short, but he made it. However, when the war was over with, he was mustered out, but he, st he stayed in the Army Reserve. He was in the Army during Korea, but he was not deployed to Korea. However, he, he, was, a current lieutenant, he was a colonel in the United States Air Force Reserve, but because of his age, he couldn't be deployed. So he left the Air Force and joined the Army. And he took a, he took a rank cut and he became a warrant officer. He, flew, he was trained to fly helicopters. And in 1969, he's 48 years old. He is the oldest Army aviator to receive a Medal of Honor in Vietnam. He rescued 29 South Vietnamese wounded soldiers in a battle along Cambodia. He was wounded himself and almost lost his aircraft. And, but he went in numerous times to rescue these guys. He put in eventually two combat tours in Vietnam. He flew over 2,400 2400 combat missions. He rescued over 5,000 men flying these missions. And he didn't realize it in the beginning uh, but he signed he signed for medals for every person on his crew on that day they rescued 29 South Vietnamese wounded soldiers. What he didn't know is they were interviewing the crew members and his commanding officer put through a medal of honor and Novosel doesn't know this. And when he's finally notified, he will have to be sent home. Uh, and keep in mind too, his son, Michael Jr., was flying missions as well. And he and his father flew some same, the same missions together in Vietnam as medical evacuation pilots. It's quite a story. 
And so he will go to the White House and President Richard Nixon will bestow the Medal of Honor on Michael Novosel. He died, Michael Novosel died a few years back. He had cancer, um, but he was in the Army, the United States Army, United States Army Air Force in World War II, United States Air Force during Korea, which he wasn't deployed for combat though, but left the Air Force and joined the Army. And then when a medal, of, he put in two tours in Vietnam, rescuing wounded uh, during that war. So this is where the helicopter has gone. And to end this, uh, following the Vietnam War, uh, you know, Korea's behind us, Vietnam's behind us. During the 1970s, again, what was done in the 1950s will be resurrected. We have to prepare the helicopter for use on the nuclear battlefield. And so in the 1950s, if you remember the movie Black Hawk Down, the 1970s rather, the Black Hawk Down, uh, that Huey helicopter, which was used in Vietnam, will be replaced by that helicopter, the Black Hawk. And then the, and then the armed helicopter, the gunship or the, or, the, or the attack helicopter, they used something known as the Cobra in Vietnam, that will eventually be replaced by the Apache, what you see now. In fact, I worked for three years at Army Aviation Magazine with a colonel who flew attack helicopters for 20 years. And he flew an Apache during the Persian Gulf War. And he told me he was on the ground floor, the desert floor, fighting against Soviet, uh, Iraqi manned so to Soviet T-72 tanks. Uh, quite an experience. It's almost, it's almost along the lines of a video game. You know, you're tracking all these targets and you fire these Hellfire missiles and boom, the tank is gone. Big difference what was going on in Korea to 1991. So now you've seen this evolution of this thing known as the helicopter. Again, spurred on by the atomic bombs in 1945 and 1946. But Korea, is where the helicopter, again, pardon the pun, takes off in a rudimentary fashion, but it's like anything else. There's a, there's a beginning, and then when it's proven to, that the, the, the concept itself is proven, the equipment becomes more numerous as well as becoming more sophisticated. The training has to become more sophisticated. And this where is where this goes with the helicopter. And so instead of these, instead of these things, costing maybe a few thousand dollars, <laughs> uh, some of these Apache helicopters now cost millions because of the, not only the weaponry, but the, 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 the radar equipment, the targeting equipment, stuff is very expensive, but does the job. It does the job. Does anybody have any questions on this aspect of, of this growth of the helicopter? Well, to, to, start, to start with, in, in Korea, uh, you know, the helicopter is just being used here. And, and you're right, Sandy, they're really not all that sophisticated at this point, although they're more sophisticated than the experimental types they had in World War II. Right. Uh, but, but they are growing a sophistication and expense. And, and so you have to train people to fix these things. However, at the same time, the idea of arming a helicopter in Korea I mean, there's a few people who thought that was possible, but they're nearly not going to go that route. Number one, the Air Force would have thrown a fit. Uh, the Air Force was the ground support group for the Army, not the Army making helicopters that are going to do this. That's going to come later on. Right now, the Army and the Marine Corps, by the way, are using helicopters for medical evacuation and moving supplies and moving men. And they're really not moving men up to the front, almost up to the front. No, they're almost to the front line, but they're not going to the front line per se. And so, so not, enemy, like in Viet, not like in Vietnam, these guys are going to be moving behind VC and North Vietnamese army lines to drop guys so off and be enemy. picked up. Well, as to that, as to that, yes, you are beginning to see at the beginning of the Vietnam War, 
when American helicopter crews, Army, Avi Army aviation air crews with helicopters are moving South Vietnamese troops. In the beginning, they're moving South Vietnamese troops. Well, the Viet Cong, Sandy, is learning too. They began to set up ambushes at landing zones. And they are getting, they are getting machine guns, 12.7 millimeter machine guns, heavy machine guns to shoot these helicopters down. And they're going to succeed in this. So now someone comes up with the idea, well, why don't we arm these, why don't we arm these helicopters? And so these, these, these CH-21s that have twin rotors now are carrying machine gunners. But that's not good enough. Someone comes up with the idea, well, why don't we make a helicopter gunship? And so when the Huey begins to be uh, uh, sent there to replace the, 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 the CH-21, which is an ungainly aircraft, but you have to use something, the Huey, the Huey was sent there just to move people around and move supplies. However, it's also going, now they're going to arm it. The problem here is, Sandy, as you start arming this and put more weapons, that means you got to carry more ammunition. What do you think happens to the speed of this aircraft? slows down right so now we got to go back to the drawing board and they will come out with a aircraft known as the ah1 cobra bell again bell bell was a leader here bell came out with this 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 helicopter had a more powerful engine carried two people a pilot a pilot and, a, and, a, and an opera radar operator and it was armed and this helicopter was was going to fly escort to the helicopters that are being used to drop men and supplies. So now you have an escort for the supply helicopters. They tried using the Huey as an escort, but as you mentioned, yes, it was being slowed down and also being developed here. They were using that, in fact, they used that at that place called Ayadrang that I talked about, you know, the, the, the we were soldiers once and young, some of these Hueys were known as ARA, aerial, aerial artillery aircraft, aerial rocket artillery. And so now you're having helicopters carrying rockets and they would follow the, 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 the carrying helicopters or the, or the personnel helicopters that are dropping men off. And these other helicopters with aerial rocket artillery were firing at the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese, keeping their heads down while the carry while the lift helicopters drop the men off. And so now they're developing these tactics based on what they're able to produce with regards to machinery. But as the war goes on, you are going to see less and less the Huey being used for, you know, as, as a gunship, as more and more Cobras begin to appear, although the Huey will always be used as it, as it will be used during the Vietnam War. But as the Cobra comes out, you are now seeing a growing tension toward real sophistication with a helicopter gunship. And what does the Air Force think of the Army doing this? Oh my God, here we go. You know, so what the Army, what the Air Force was afraid of, putting them out of business, let's understand something. If the Air Force is put out of business with regards to ground support, you think they're gonna get as much money in their budget? No. Okay. And so, in fact, the Air Force in the 1940s didn't want the Marine Corps to have aircraft. And the Navy stepped in and said, whoa, wait a minute. You know, no. And so the Navy will protect the Marine Corps because when you go to the Marine Corps, Marine Corps Air, those pilots exist for one thing only, one thing and one thing only in reality here to protect the Marine carrying the rifle on the ground. That's what they exist for. That's their main lot in life. Now, the, the, the Huey had one main rotor and a little rear rotor. If your, rotor, if your main rotor got shot out, you're, you're, you're gonna land. <laughs> During World War II, there was a destroyer that blew up and sank off the coast of New Jersey. And the water was shallow. Actually, the destroyer was still sticking up. But at one point, there had been a huge fire. This is in 1945, I think it was. I'm not sure. I have to go back and take a look at the case. It was in January, and there was a huge blizzard. And a, and a uh, lieutenant commander, I forgot his name now, had an, had an old Sikorsky R4, which, was, which, which some guys used to call an egg beater. 
And so he, he got a couple of uh, cases of plasma and stuck it to the rungs, right? And he took off in a blizzard in New York City. And he went off Cape, I think it, I think it was Cape May, New Jersey, I think. Yeah. yeah. And he, he brought plasma to the hospital there in a driving snowstorm, Coast Guard. And, and so he saved a lot of sailors' lives. And this is during World War II with a helicopter that some people looked on as suspect. It wasn't mechanically reliable, yeah, but he, not without, without any reservation, got the plasma, put it in the chopper, and took off. Now, he could, and he, and he, he was in New York City, which means he's got to fly this thing at one point between the buildings to get out in a snowstorm. Talk about chutzpah here. Talk about guts. Uh, I not now that now that I, now that I, now that you've asked about this. Now I got to go back and take a look at my records. Well, you know, I mean, the thing with the helicopter too is, and and this is what people like John uh, James Gavin figured out that you know this again, parachutes are not reliable. You can be blown out of your landing zone. Uh, the the glider sometimes is not reusable, but a helicopter can be reusable, and it and not only that, it can drop down, pick the drop the guys off, come back and pick them up. Yeah. It's reusable, and so this 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 idea. In fact, I, I mentioned this I think in a previous talk when I did Vietnam: The Long War, uh, going back to the chariot, the Syrian use of the chariot. He had a chariot driver, and he had three three warriors. You know, and you get a group of chariots attacking the enemy, and they each of these chariot drivers would drop off their three warriors and then retreat. And then when it was time, go back and pick up their warriors with the chariot and take them someplace else. Well, what's the difference between what was going on in 800 BC with the with the chariot as opposed to what a Huey helicopter pilot is doing in Vietnam in 1965? It's the the principle is the same. It's the technology that differs. So instead of dropping three guys off, we're dropping off seven, eight, nine, ten 10 guys. And then we go back and pick them up. So it's interesting how the basic premise in, 20, in 2,500 years is basically the same. It's just the technology different. So it's fascinating here. But again, uh, this notion of the atomic bomb as a spur to the use of a helicopter. Yeah, and so you might think that's insanity having guys fight on a nuclear battlefield. It wasn't considered insanity by some of these generals who thought, well, if we use the proper use of these light aircraft and helicopters, we move these guys around. So they're not exposed. They're not exposed to uh, radiation. But then again, that depends what kind of uh, atomic weapon we were talking about here. You know, if it's a battlefield nuclear weapon, maybe. If, if, if it's a strategic nuclear weapon, forget it. You know, these guys are gonna be fried. But, uh, but this, is what, this is what they were thinking. And another reason the army is thinking this way in the 1950s, they don't wanna be put out of, out of a job. You know, if the Air Force has sold Congress on the idea of mass retaliation with nuclear bombers, what do you need an army for? Or what do you need a big army for? Well, we better find ourselves a job here. So they train for a nuclear battlefield. So it's interesting. And yet that idea is going to pop up again in the 1970s and in the 1980s. So, and then if you remember in 1987, the operation in Grenada, where they sent in the Army and the Marine Corps. And how do you think they did that? With the helicopter. So, interesting. And then all you got to do is turn on the six o'clock news today when they have Afghanistan or Iraq on. Aren't they dropping guys off with a helicopter or picking them up with a helicopter? Yeah, they are. So that process hasn't changed. Although I will say one thing in case someone asks the question. I'm writing something now for Army Aviation Magazine on the Soviet use of the helicopter in Afghanistan. You know, we're not in the jungles anymore. And the helicopter in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen or the guerrillas, the, 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 the soldiers of God had to learn to deal with this. And they will. In fact, the Soviets, as the war goes on, their loss rate of the helicopters goes up. Why? 
because some of these battles were fought in the mountains. And you can't expect Soviet soldiers wearing these bulletproof vests, which, which some of these weighed over 13, 15 pounds, and they're carrying a weapon with all this ammunition to hike up to 3,000, 4,500 feet and go fight. You're going to be winded, right? Well, you get them there by a helicopter. But there's a lot of crevices, caves, and outcrops. And these Mujahideen would wait. They might have an RPG-7, I think, as Keith was alluding to earlier, or a blowpipe or even a stinger missile. And as the helicopter flies by, what do you think these Mujahideen are doing? <whistles> Zapping it. And so the loss rate for Soviets went up. So now we're not in a jungle. We're still fighting guerrillas, but it's not in a jungle. It's now in Afghanistan. And the Soviets are going to lose over, over 300 helicopters in that war to these Mujahideen. So, but the helicopter proved its worth. It proved, it still proved its worth. So every weapon has its weak point and the helicopter certainly has, has its, its weak points. So, you know, at one point in 1944, when the, when the Battle of the Bulge was on, uh, Roosevelt even made mention of ending the war real quick here with a bomb, but we didn't have the, but the United States didn't have the bomb yet. Um, when the Germans surrendered and, you know, the, on July 16, 1945 with Operation Trinity, Tr uh, Truman was told that we now have the bomb. And some people thought, uh, Hap Arnold, I think was against it. Um, Churchill was against it, I believe. There were officers, officers in the military who were against it, but there were some who were for it um, because the, Jap the, the Japanese militarists weren't going to give up. They, were, they didn't want to surrender regardless. And of course, this is part of the, this is part of the emperor. This is the fault of the emperor too, from the perspective that he didn't really run the country. The, 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 the militants did. And so when it, after the first bomb, uh, you know, the, the Japanese had a plan all set to meet the invasion when it came, the, the planned invasion in November and another one in March, 1946. And so with how the Japanese resisted, especially in the last couple of battles of the Pacific War, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, they're picture, some officers are picturing what the losses will be like if they ever land in Japan. And so they drop the first bomb and finally Hirohito tells the, mili tells the, tells the, 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 the militarists, look, you better have a meeting and call an amen to this because this isn't working. And so the meeting is set for the morning of August 9. Well, what happens the morning of August 9? Nagasaki. And that's the same day that the Soviet Far Eastern Army attacked the Kwantung Army in Manchuria. Stalin kept his word. And so where are the Japanese going here? You know, so they're gonna, they're gonna call an end to it. In fact, the emperor will make two transcripts to be read over the radio to the Japanese people on August 14. The night before, a squad of the milita militarists, majors and captains, majors and colonels, broke into the imperial palace to find those transcripts and destroy them because they wanted to keep fighting. They weren't found, and the message will and the surrender will be read out out over the airwaves. And keep in mind this this is epic, because many of the people in Japan had never heard the emperor speak before. Now he's speaking directly to the people. And so the bombs destroyed something else, not just 300,000 Japanese dead. They, it des they destroyed this idea of the emperor as a living God. The notion that he is God on earth is destroyed. If he was God on earth, Japan never would have suffered this comeuppance. Apparently he's flesh and blood, puts his shoes on one foot at a time like everybody else. The bombs destroyed that. Interesting. Apparently the physicists were more God 
than the God was. And they were men, not gods. Next week, when we come back, uh, this, which is the last week, I am going to, um, we're going to talk about what effect the Korean War had. And I'm, and I'm going to focus on 1954. Uh, not, it's, it, let's understand the situation here. July 27, 1953, the ceasefire is signed and the war, the shooting stops, but the tensions are still there. But then again, with the uh, Geneva talks that are going to come up, how does, how does North, v how does what's happening to the French in North Vietnam affect this? And you're going to find that out next week. So it's interesting here how these two, these two situations, Korea and Vietnam, you're going to see how they come together and influence United States policy here in 1954 and how it changes our approach to Asia. That's where this is eventually going to go. Well, the Marines brought back the F4U Corsair. Uh -huh. They brought that back, which... Which wasn't which wasn't a bad ground support plane. They were using that in Korea, to, uh, using that in World War II as well. I mean, the 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 Corsair uh, could carry you know uh, six fifty caliber machine guns. They even had a version. I, th I think it was. I'm not sure if it was the the, the U version. No, it wasn't the U version that carried four twenty millimeter cannon. Yeah. And it could carry napalm if they needed it to. And so. However, in World War II, the Army Air Force, the United States Army Air Force was using a lot the P-47 Thunderbolt for right. a ground attack. However, uh, this, we, we didn't really produce a plane that was strictly a ground attack aircraft. And the, the United States Army Air Force and later the Air Force would not want to do that because they thought that would wedded, they wet, that wedded them to ground attack aviation. And they didn't want to do that. They wanted a plane that could do almost everything. Well, what you're talking about with the P-51, the P-51 came into its own as a long range fighter that didn't right. need drop tanks to escort 17s and 24s over Germany. And it was a superlative combat aircraft as soon as it got the Rolls Royce Merlin. <laughs> yep. uh, it came into its own. In fact, you will see, you can go through the records and see that a number of P-51 pilots shot down ME-262 jets. Yeah, I just, and so that's that's quite an accomplishment for a plane that, for a, for a plane, the ME-262, which did over 500 miles an hour. And yeah. I remember, I think it was Robin Oles, I think. He, he, was, he flew a P-51 in Europe, and I think he shot down 18 planes, who later became General Robin Oles. And he said he chased an ME-262. <laughs> he said he had everything. To, he, thought the, he thought that Rolls-Royce Merlin was going to leap off the mounts. <laughs> he had everything to the firewall because a prop plane is only going to go so fast. Right. That's it. However, he was able to gun one of the two engines on the 262. And what happened? <laughs> well, that plane slowed down right away. And he was able to finish it off. But... The Air Force did not want to build a plane so or have a plane built solely for ground support. And the Air Force is going to be forced in Vietnam after during during the Vietnam War to consider one. When the uh, when the art when the art when Bell came out with the Cobra, uh, there was also work being done on a plane on an aircraft which will never be mass produced. It was called the Cheyenne, the AH-54 Cheyenne. It was armored. It, carried, it was the most sophisticated, probably the most sophisticated helicopter of its time. It was fast and it could really pound the ground. However, with cost overruns, too much time. And on top of that, the Air Force was coming out with a plane I like a lot, the A-10. Yes. And so the oh. Cheyenne was canceled and the Air Force did not want to make the A-10. Right. But, you know, the, the, the Soviets, uh, in fact, um, Eddie Rickenbacker, representing the United States, was one time in the Soviet Union during the Second World War. And he got a chance to look at the IL-2 Sturmovik. And he said, yeah, nobody made a plane like this 
anywhere. That's at the time. It was armored on the bottom. Right. <laughs> it, you know, German. You can you can see re, re, you you can see repeated uh, uh, the observations by these German uh, ground ground gunners, any aircraft gunners. Their twenty millimeter cannon shells broke up on the bottom of the Sturmovik, and it was a fairly fast plane, but it was a great ground support slash tank buster, and it was hard to shoot down. Uh, Sometimes some people. Some people made that comment that it was like punching an anvil, <laughs> almost like the P-47 Thunderbolt. But it was a it was really a tough aircraft, but arguably the best aircraft of its type produced during the war. Hmm. In fact, Stalin later said that the Red Army needed the Stromovic as much as it needs air to breathe. Hmm. That's a tall statement. That's a tall statement. Well, I think so these... when you have something like the Sturmovik made it up with the T-34 tank, what have right. you got here? Wow. Wow. So death to Panzers. They had phased that plane out by then. And in fact, it goes on record as being the heaviest single engine fighter of the entire Second World War at yep. seven and a half tons. Yet it could still do 430 miles an hour. And if you put it into a dive, it sank like a piece of lead. <laughs> but it was very uh, heavily armored too, wasn't it? It sure was. In fact, uh, at Noah Community College, uh, if you've ever gone up to the Air Museum up near Harford, and there's a P-47 display there. And one of my students who was in Lifetime Learners, this guy, Ed, flew the P-47 in World War II. Wow. And they asked him to be uh, one of the one of the uh, sources for this display up in Harford. And I was asking Ed. I said, "Well, uh, we, I, he said he flew in the 15th Air Force." I said, "You were flying out of Italy." He goes, "Yeah, that's right." And I said, "Well, what did you do?" He goes, "He says mainly I was shooting up uh, troop concentrations, truck convoys, trains, ammo dumps, uh, gun emplacements." He said, "I did ground support work." I said, how many missions you fly? He goes, 85. Oh. And I said, I said, Ed, did you ever get shot up? He goes, Mark, they had to replace my plane five times. <laughs> he said he was coming down. He said, he said, he says, he says, I could do about 420, 430 miles an hour. And he said, I had that huge four bladed prop. Right. And he said, I came down on a Nazi train and he said, I had that sucker all lined up and he says he had 850 caliber machine gun. Right. And he said, I pressed the button and he says, he says, when you're in a 47, even those 850s, he says, it's like the plane stops short and that shoulder harness bites into your shoulders and pushes you back into the seat. He said, it's quite a feeling. The, the recoil from the machine yeah. guns. He, actually slows and he said he could watch down. his tracers as they came together on the track. And he just followed him from the caboose in each car, each car, each car. He says to me, he says, he goes, he says to me, he goes, those krauts had a quad 20 on a flat car. And he said, they filled my belly full of flack. And he says, he says, he says, what, I he got the base. Yeah. He, he says, yeah. He says, he, they shot out two cylinders. My hydraulics were gone. I'm leaking. He says, I'm leaking fluid all over the place. But he said, it got me home. And he says, I didn't have any landing gear. I'm down two cylinders. And he says, I came down on, I, on the runway. And he says, what I did was I made sure I went off on the grass to cut down on the fire hazard, although he says I'm out of fuel. And he said, he hit the ground. And he says, you've seen this in the movies where the plops, the prop stops and it's the, the blades are bent back. He says, I'm seeing it though from the, from the <laughs> cockpit. And he's sliding off. He said, what I didn't know was my crew chief is running alongside the plane. He beat the trucks. <laughs> he says, finally, when the plane came to a rest, the, he says, my crew chief jumps on the wing, helps open the cockpit. And he goes, hey, Colonel. And he says, no, he was, no, he was a captain. He goes, hey, Major, a captain, you all right? <laughs> and said, and Ed was kind of a low key guy. And he says, I said something. He says, I, I would never in my lifetime thought I would say, he goes, he says, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, write the taxpayers and tell them I need another plane. <laughs> yeah, he was 20. 
he was he was 23, I think, and he was a, he retired from the army as a colonel, but uh, at that time he was a major as a captain, and that was 1944. But he said though he said he said those krauts got my number that day. He said they shot my belly. He said they filled my belly full of flack. He just died. He was 90. Is he 95? I think Ed Delahoff. I think his name was. I have to go back and check my um, my my roster of students. He was that he was the nicest guy you ever want to meet. He took all my World War II classes. And the one the class he liked the best was the one I did on the Great Patriotic War, because he mm. said, Mark, I knew next to nothing of that. I knew he says I knew next to nothing. And um, in fact, a lot of the World War II guys that were in lifetime learners. They all took that class because they didn't know a lot about the Russian front and they wanted to know it. Enjoy. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you for coming.